This is the fourth Nimtum Forum. Once it was two, twice it was held in Berlin, once in Prague, and today in Warsaw. It's the fourth time. We will have a great speech, the Freedom Speech, which will be. Which this is traditionally delivered by philosophers, writers, chaplains. Alice Ganyev and other writers delivered this freedom, this speech, and today it was, will be delivered by uh, Francis Fukuyama from Stanford University. In 2017, I took part in a three-week program run by the professor in Stanford. You might think that three weeks, it's not a lot of time, but to me it really was a very important experience, and th thanks to this program, I have managed to make changes in my life, and I'm very proud to have been your student. So, thank you very much, Jana. I remember you at our program in 2017. Uh, you were one of our best students, and you've done what we wanted. Uh, you've gone on to do great things in building up uh, this foundation in honor of your father. And I uh, must say that I'm extremely honored and humbled to be invited uh, to Warsaw to uh, speak to all of you today. Uh, I just want to say a little bit about what Boris uh, Nemtsov uh, symbolizes to me. So obviously, as previous speakers have said, he symbolizes a vision of a very different kind of Russia, uh, a Russia that is open and democratic. Uh, I think he represents the idea that somehow uh, authoritarian government and aggression are not genetically part of the Russian character, but uh, there are other types of people that have different views of what Russia could be. And I think we have to keep that in mind, that there's a difference between the Russian regime and the Russian people, and that is really our, uh, our hope for the future. The other thing about your father that really very much um, uh, humbles me is the fact that he went from being a public official, being the governor of Nizhny Novgorod, exercising power as part of the establishment, uh, to being an opposition activist where he lost all of his privileges, his access to people with power and influence uh, and wealth. Uh, there are many people who, faced with that kind of a choice, would have clung to whatever power uh, they could have at the expense of their principles and their dignity. But your father did not do that. Uh, it's a choice that I think very few people are willing to make. I think Alexei Navalny, uh, sitting in the front row here, is another uh, figure that has made a similar kind of choice. And I must say, as somebody that lives in a very safe environment at Stanford University, it's a choice I've never uh, been forced to take. Uh, I'm grateful for that, but I also tremendously admire uh, people that do make that choice. So thank you to your father and uh, to you, Alexei. So uh, I want to begin um, just by talking a little bit about a couple of experiences I had uh, here in Warsaw, because I think it's a good introduction to the general topic of what's happened in the world. Uh, in the 30 years since 1989. 1989 was my first visit to Warsaw. At that time, I was working for the Department of State for Secretary of State James Baker, and I was on a global trip that he took. Uh, we met up with President uh, George H.W. Bush uh, in Gdansk and in Warsaw in the summer of 1989. He, President Bush gave a I think a well-remembered speech in Gdansk and then met uh, with the new leaders of Solidarity. It was after the Polish roundtable and the clear change in direction uh, of the Polish uh, government. And I distinctly remember that trip. Uh, I missed a baggage call on my way to Warsaw, so I didn't have my luggage. I had to go buy a suit that morning <laughs> uh, in a store near the hotel. And I remember I paid $20 uh, for a suit and tie because the zwati was so low against the dollar. And, um, you know, the city looked shabby, as communist cities did at that period, but there was an incredible amount of hope. And when I travel 
through Warsaw today, 30 years later, it's a miracle. I mean, it is a real miracle that uh, this country has prospered and done as well, both politically and economically, uh, as, it, uh, as it has. Uh, I had another experience in 2004, the year that Poland joined the European Union. I was at a conference in the Vatican, and I was seated at lunch uh, between a high German, former German finance of official and a Polish diplomat who had served in the Polish resistance, and they had actually fought on opposite sides during the Second World War, and yet they were gathered at that moment to celebrate the fact that Poland was entering uh, into the European Union. And I think that, unfortunately, today, we take this for granted. The idea that the European Union has been unbelievably successful in its primary mission, which was to make uh, conflict, violent conflict in Europe, uh, impossible. That succeeded beyond uh, anyone's wildest uh, dreams. The possibility of war in Europe is vanishingly uh, small as a result of this institution. Uh, and I think, unfortunately, that one of the things that's happened is that you've had an entire generation of people in this part of the world that have grown up in that world. They've been born with no living memory of communism, of authoritarian government, of what it meant to uh, live under that, that kind of regime. And as a result, they take democracy for granted. They take the European Union for granted. They take the institutions that have produced that degree of peace and prosperity as part of their birthright. And, you know, it's natural they want to move on to other issues, but they do forget uh, about some of the historical and institutional grounds on which their own peace and security uh, depends. And I think that's one of the reasons why we are now moving into, unfortunately, a very different kind of political era in which there are a number of new and very distinctive uh, threats to democracy uh, worldwide. So let me go over them. They're going to be, I think, pretty obvious to most people in this audience, but I think we need to review them. Thank you. So the most obvious change in the world is the rise of new authoritarian powers. Uh, primarily Russia and China. Uh, they have consolidated their regimes. They are authoritarian. Russia pretends to operate under a facade of democratic practice, but in fact, uh, at core, it is a, an authoritarian regime. They differ, however, in the kinds of long-term challenges uh, that they pose. Let me begin uh, with Russia. Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, believes that his country is at war with the West. Uh, it's a war that began several years ago. He is conducting it uh, through a variety of methods. Obviously, it can't be an open, violent war because that's a war that he would lose. But he's been extremely resourceful in bringing to bear all of the assets that he can in order to uh, weaken uh, what he regards as his uh, enemies. Uh, I don't think that he really had a good idea uh, of, the, I, uh, of what was really uh, behind this, this conflict, other than the fact that he did not like the West and saw it as a strategic rival. So I think for the first 10 or even 15 years of his presidency, he was searching around for a set of ideas that would justify why Russia was what it was and why it was different from the West. So, he came up with ideas like sovereign democracy. I actually spent an hour in the Kremlin back in 2006 talking to Vladislav Surkov about this idea. It made no sense to me whatsoever, and I don't think it made much sense to most Russians uh, either. But I think today he has found a role for himself in a new Europe as the sponsor of the anti-establishment populist groups as a champion you know, of Christian values, of family values, of a certain traditional type of social conservatism. Not, I think, because he's a Christian or really believes in values of any sort, but because these are useful as a way of gaining allies and of particularly um, weakening those powers that he sees as his primary uh, democratic 
uh, rivals. One important difference between Putin and the old Soviet Union is the fact that he's willing to take risks on a level that we've really not seen coming out of Moscow in quite a while. I actually wrote my uh, doctoral dissertation on Soviet foreign policy in the Middle East. The Soviet Union had threatened to intervene in the, East on, uh, in the Middle East on six occasions uh, in the post-war period, but they never intended to actually deploy troops there. And Putin has done that. My entire thesis is now thrown out the window because we now have a Russian regime that there and in many other spheres is willing to take, that has fewer resources, relatively speaking, uh, than the Soviet Union did, and it's compensating for that by taking risks at a much higher level. And that is obviously something that is very bad, both for its neighbors uh, that have to live next to, uh, next to it, and for world peace in general, because one of these days, one of those risks is going to escalate into an open confrontation, I think, that will be very difficult for anyone uh, to control. Uh, it's a very interesting form of warfare that Russia is conducting. Uh, I don't think that even as the leader of this conservative bloc that Putin really believes that he has a social system that anyone really admires. There are very few people in the world that want to be like Russia. I mean, maybe they want to have its oil uh, and energy resources, but they don't want to be a society like Russia, so he knows that he can't sell uh, that system. Uh, what he can do is weaken everybody else. And so what he has done through social media, through the weaponization of the internet, uh, through a host of uh, hybrid warfare techniques, is to basically make the real democracies of the world less confident uh, of themselves. And that, unfortunately, has worked because many democracies are internally very divided. They're highly polarized, including my country, the United States, and that provides an open field for a country like Russia uh, to meddle. And so Russians can imitate a Black Lives Matter activist in the United States just as well as a, uh, a conservative, um, uh, a social conservative. Uh, and that is exactly what they've done. This is what they've been doing in Georgia, in the Baltic states, in Ukraine, uh, in many other countries uh, around the world. And it represents uh, a very difficult and new kind of challenge. China, I believe, is a different uh, animal altogether. In the long run, I actually think the, uh, the, the challenge of China is a greater one than, than Russia for a number of reasons. First of all, the Chinese have shown that they can master the highest levels of modern technology. They have a very sophisticated, very competitive economy. Uh, in another 10, 15 years, it may be larger than the American economy in absolute terms. Uh, and that is something that Russia simply cannot, uh, cannot aspire to. And that degree of wealth and power uh, is showing up uh, all over the world through this Belt and Road Initiative by which they are uh, expanding their uh, influence. In a certain way, they are creating a totalitarian system that is far more ambitious than the one that the Soviet Union attempted in the 20th century. They're using artificial intelligence, facial recognition, machine learning, the most advanced technological uh, methods in order to minutely control the day-to-day -day lives of every one of their 1.2 billion citizens. That's something really that no totalitarian regime could aspire to. Whether they actually get there, we don't know, but it is, uh, it is clearly part of the game plan. Uh, and in a way, I think that China is more dangerous than Russia in a way because it's not a risk taker. The Chinese leadership, I think, has been by and large patient uh, and cautious in a way that Putin's Russia has not been. And you know, one of the consequences of that is that Putin has met a lot of resistance. Because he's taken so many risks, because he's been so outrageously aggressive in Crimea, in the Donbass, in other places, uh, it's generated a lot of resistance. And so now Russia is under sanctions. It's opposed by uh, most of the, you know, a coalition of the most powerful countries in the world. China has not put itself in that position.
uh, and I think in the long run, therefore, uh, may pose an even greater challenge. And the challenge there is really uh, of a model, an alternative model that is authoritarian, that is somewhat market-oriented, but is definitely uh, something very different from Western uh, liberal democracy. So those are the obvious geopolitical challenges that we face. But in my view, there's a more insidious threat to democracy that has arisen not from these external authoritarian powers, but from within some of the oldest and most established democracies themselves. And I'm thinking here, obviously, of the United States and of the United uh, Kingdom. And this is the threat that is posed by populism. Uh, over the past few years, we have seen the rise of anti-establishment parties uh, that have gained hold in a number of uh, European countries and in the United States. I think that it is important to understand both what the nature of this threat is and what some of the causes are. Now, the reason I think that this is a threat to democracy is the following. A liberal democracy is a combination of institutions. It should involve a modern state. It should involve a rule of law that restricts the exercise of power. And it should involve democratic accountability in which governments are responsible to their citizens or to as large a group of the citizens as possible. What's happened with the rise of populism uh, in Europe, in the United States, uh, is that democratic majorities have legitimately elected governments that then have gone, to, gone on to try to dismantle the other two institutions, an impartial bureaucracy, and in particular, a rule of law that seeks to limit uh, the scope of executive power. They've done this by undermining judicial independence, by trying to um, capture and organize as much of the media uh, as possible by seeding the bureaucracy with their own party militants by basically taking control of as many of the levers of power uh, as possible. Uh, in other words, the democratic part of this three-part structure has infiltrated and weakened the other two legs of, I think, what are the necessary parts of a modern functioning uh, liberal democracy. And so you'll have democratically elected governments, but they will not be limited in their powers. And in the long run, uh, you may be getting to a point where they simply will not be, uh, you'll not be able to vote them out of office because they will control the electoral machinery uh, and put up too many obstacles to actually a democratic uh, transition of power. So that's the, uh, the threat that I think we face. The reasons for this uh, were the subject of the last book I wrote, a book called Identity. Uh, because I think that there has been uh, a degree of misunderstanding about why populism has suddenly uh, appeared in the world. The conventional wisdom uh, about the rise of populism says that it is economic. Uh, we have a world that has lived under a set of rules that have been described as constituting a liberal international order. There are economic rules, the different trade uh, agreements, the World Trade Organization, the European Union, the North American Free Trade uh, Agreement that have facilitated the movement of goods, investments, services, people across international borders. And there's a political component to this, the NATO alliance, the US-Japan, US-Korea security pacts that have protected these democracies against uh, external threats. And that has been extraordinarily uh, successful, not just here in Poland, but uh, across the world, where global output has quadrupled between 1970 and, let's say, the crisis, the economic crisis in 2008. So it's produced a great deal of wealth, but obviously that wealth has not been equally distributed. Not every individual in every country uh, has benefited from this general increase in wealth, and in particular, uh, less educated uh, working class people in developed countries have been losing employment to a rising middle class in places like China or India or Vietnam or Bangladesh. Uh, 
All right, so this is a very familiar story. I think many people have commented on uh, the kind of inequality that has emerged in the world, and that inequality is uh, really stunning. There was a recent study in the United States that showed that the richest 400 families in the United States basically uh, held the same degree of wealth as the bottom 40% of the American population. And so that's a degree of economic inequality that we saw earlier in the 20th century, uh, in the 1920s, preceding the Great Depression, but we've really not seen it since. And I think the stability of many of our democracies is dependent on you know, the, the more equal distribution of wealth that occurred in the immediate decades following uh, the Second World War. So that's, that's the conventional story. If that was enough to explain the rise of populism, however, uh, you should have seen a rise of left-wing uh, populism because you have a very unequal world. It's the parties of the left that want to uh, redistribute income through taxation, that want a strong welfare state, that want social protections. And yet, what we've seen since the uh, financial crisis in the United States and in the Eurozone uh, over the past decade is not the rise of left-wing parties. In fact, the left-wing parties, by and large, have done very poorly. What we've seen is the rise of right-wing populism. There is something that the right-wing populist understood that the left-wing parties did not. And I think that that is related to this issue of identity. Uh, it is a cultural factor rather than uh, an economic one. So identity is based on a psychological uh, phenomenon. Uh, we human beings believe that we have an inner self that deserves recognition. Uh, we believe that we have an inner worth. We want other people in our society to recognize that worth, to accord us the kind of dignity and respect that we think uh, that we deserve. And if we do not get that respect, we get angry. And it leads immediately into politics because I think anger is probably the dominant emotion. You know, people are really not very rational, and they're particularly not rational in politics. Uh, and I think the reason for that is that a lot of politics is dignity politics. It's about people that feel unrecognized. They feel invisible to their fellow human beings, and they get angry about it, and that's what drives them to mobilize, to form political parties, to vote, uh, and to be active uh, in the political world. And I think that this has been happening uh, in a very changed sociological landscape around the world. It used to be in the 20th century that the dominant uh, conflicts and polarizations were over economic ideology. It was over communism versus capitalism or between social democracy and free market uh, 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 you know, democracy. Uh, where the left wanted more redistribution, more in, more, um, less inequality, the right wanted more freedom, more market-based solutions. That has been replaced today by an increasing, uh, a world in which the polarizations are increasingly revolving around identity, meaning my belief that my dignity rests with my membership in a particular fixed community, and that community is oftentimes defined in biological terms, by my ethnicity, by my race, sometimes by my religion, sometimes by my gender or, or ethnicity or other uh, factors. But these are factors that we don't have control over. They're fixed, we're born with them. And therefore, a world that is organized around identity is one that is harder to neg negotiate. You can argue over what's an appropriate tax rate. You can go a little bit higher or a little bit lower. But if you say, well, the national identity of Hungary is to be an ethnic Hungarian, there's not a lot of negotiation you can have over you know, issues like uh, citizenship if you accept that premise, which, by the way, is what Viktor Orban has stated uh, very clearly in uh, any number of uh, public pronouncements. And so I think that this quest for identity and community is what's really driving uh, a lot of the right-wing populism. And by the way, you know, one of the things that I think 
people that are more liberally minded, and I put myself in that category, uh, one of the things that people that are more liberally minded fail to recognize is the fact that there is some justice in that accusation that those people that are being left behind are not just economically worse off, they're not respected, right? And the sociology of voting in the world has shifted very, very dramatically where instead of this left-right division, you basically have a division based on levels of education and place of residence. So for example, in the United States, the single uh, most powerful predictor of who voted for Donald Trump is population density. You know, the people that voted for Hillary Clinton all live in big cities, even in red states. They live in the capital city or the university town. And then everybody else that lives in a second or third tier city or out in the countryside uh, votes for the populist party. The same is true in Britain. I would imagine that the same is true here in Poland uh, as well. And so you're seeing a division that is based on education but also based on culture where there is a recognition by the people that are not part of the elite that their politics, their economic choices, their political choices have been dictated by an elite that is better educated than them, that has more economic opportunities, that sets the cultural standards because these are the people that make the films and do the plays and you know, write the articles and do the journalism that over the last several decades have really defined what their societies look like and they feel invisible. They feel invisible to this class of people and it's therefore very easy for a demagogic politician to come along and say, well, the reason that these elites, you know, these elites really don't have your interests in mind, they're inviting all these foreigners into the country, they are changing your national identity that you thought you were part of into something different that you never asked for, and this is happening through institutions like the European Union that you fundamentally uh, don't control. Now, this is not, <laughs> I think, overall a an accurate characterization, but I think there is enough truth in it that it has had a great deal of appeal in many countries, in many developed democracies around the world. And I think that you don't begin to heal that polarization until you recognize these um, dignity issues that lie really, I think, uh, at the root of the anger that drives people to vote for populist parties. All right, so I don't want to uh, leave you too pessimistic about the world. This has been a pretty pessimistic speech, and I will say uh, something uh, to cheer you up at the end, uh, which is to say that, um, first of all, history is really not made by these big underlying structural forces of the sort that Marxists talk about. There's no mechanism of history that inevitably drives us forward. There are structural factors, but uh, by and large, uh, individuals still matter, leaders still matter, and voters still matter. So the choices that all of us make in the short run really do affect uh, longer term prospects for our respective political systems. I think that the spark that animated the uprisings of 1989 are not gone from the world. Uh, if you look around the world today, at places like you know Armenia, Sudan, Algeria, Ethiopia, Burma, Ukraine, all of these places have, uh, Hong Kong I think is the most uh, recent of these, all of these have people in them that are willing to take enormous risks to go out into the streets uh, and to demonstrate against an authoritarian political system because people want that kind of freedom. They may not agree on the kind of political system that will replace uh, that authoritarian system, but they do not like living under uh, a dictatorship. And so that spark that we saw everywhere in this region of the world in 1989 is still alive, and it is still alive, I think, in Eastern Europe where people are pushing back against uh, these new populist politicians uh, even as we speak. Uh, I think that the lesson that I take from all of this is that if this pushback, if a, if a backlash to the backlash is to emerge and our democracies, our liberal democracies are to be preserved, uh, 
It really depends on the individual leadership and the decisions that all of us take as political actors, as voters, as citizens, and as leaders. Uh, it would not happen but for people like Boris Nemtsov or Alexei Navalny that are willing to take the kinds of personal risks that are required uh, to exercise this sort of leadership. So uh, I salute them and I salute all of you, uh, members of civil society and organizations that I think want a more open democratic world. Uh, and uh, I congratulate Jana for organizing this wonderful forum. So thank you, thank you very much.